Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about descendancy research. Um, I'm not going to give too much of an introduction because we've got a lot to cover and I wanted to actually give you a few visuals of exactly what descendancy research is. I'll share with you some of the tips and tricks that I use when I do descendancy research um, and then some of the places you can go to uh, make sure that you can do it as well. Um, and keep track of everything as you go. So with that brief introduction, let's go ahead and dive in. Let's first just talk about what descendancy research is. In, uh, in traditional genealogy or ancestry research, uh, you start with yourself and you work backwards one generation at a time. Uh, you start with what you know about yourself and then you put in what you know about your parents, um, your grandparents, your great grandparents, and you discover information as you go. I hope you'll, you're also not just doing um, or including information about the people on this pedigree. I hope you're also including information about siblings, your parents' siblings, your grandparents' siblings, and so on. Anytime you do that, it's going to help you go back another generation. Um, so for example, your grandfather's death certificate might not list his mother's maiden name, but his sister's death certificate might. And so that's why it's always really important to trace siblings as well. Now, that's traditional ancestry research. You work your way back a generation at a time. In descendancy research, you pick an ancestor and you trace all of that ancestor's descendants. So um, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and so on. In this case, you, know, you are one of those people in that line. So for example, this is a, uh, let's see, a paternal, um, fathers, uh, it looks like a paternal grandmother's line that gets you up to this common ancestor here. And so you have these um, other people included. So you're tracing not just the siblings of your ancestor, but you're also tracing their children as well. And so you end up with lots of second and third and fourth cousins. Now there are a lot of reasons why you would want to do descendancy research to this level. Um, everybody has their own reasons. For me, the very first descendancy research project I started, it started with just a curiosity. I had a third great grandfather who I was particularly interested in. I wanted to know more about him and his life and had studied a lot, actually uh, enough gathered enough information to write a biography about him, and I wanted to see what had happened to his descendants, where they had ended up in the world. Um, he was just this incredible man, and I had learned so much about him, and I wanted to see what traits of his had been passed on down through the family. And so I started with his 18 children, um, his 98 grandchildren, and just kind of it grew from there. Uh, he was born about 205 years ago now, and we're up to about 86, 86. 700 descendants of this one man uh, just born a couple hundred years ago. And it's been really interesting to see um, the different traits that have been passed down through the different branches of the family. Also, it's been interesting to see the different pieces of information that have been passed down through the family. Some members of the family have photos that none of the rest of us had ever seen until we started contacting each other. Um, one member of the family had actually uh, inherited through her branch of the family the tea set that this great-grandfather's uh, first wife had brought over with them from Scotland when they immigrated to Canada. So lots of different reasons why you want to do descendancy research. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of um, collecting those cousins and making those connections. Sometimes it's uh, to honor that particular ancestor, uh, to see what has happened to their legacy uh, over time. Sometimes it's because connecting with some of those cousins can actually help you uh, with real ancestry research as you realize that different branches of the family have inherited different pieces of information over time. And so lots of other reasons, but those are some of the main reasons why I do descendancy research and a brief description of what it is. And so let's talk about then the how. The first thing you need to know is that you need to just focus. <laughs> that seems to be a challenge all of us have. We all have a little bit of, of genealogy ADD where um, we tend to, to just follow the leaves or the hints wherever they take us. And sometimes we end up down a rabbit hole and working on families that aren't even a horse. Um, this is a really methodical approach to family history, which is another reason why I love it. So you'll pick one ancestor or one ancestral couple and focus on them. You're going to start with that one couple. So in my case, um, I'm working on a project right now 
for an ancestor of mine who was a, an early Quaker in New Jersey, and I'm trying to uh, identify all of his descendants. And so I've picked that one couple. So then you're going to identify everything you know about that one family unit, that ancestral couple and their children. Um, and just like ancestral research, you're going to collect every piece of information you can about an individual and their immediate family before you move on to the next generation. It's very easy to find one census or to find one death certificate and think we've got the information we need, we're going to move on. But the reality is, if you've been doing this for any length of time, you know, no single piece of information or no single document is always 100% accurate. Census records often have errors. Birth and death certificates often have errors. Tombstones often have errors. Uh, even just because it's carved in stone doesn't make it fact. But when you collect all of those pieces of information in concert, you are usually able to resolve some of that conflicting evidence and come to some conclusions. And so make sure you collect every census and every certificate that's available and every marriage record and every cemetery record and anything that you can find, every military record, anything you can find about a, a, an a family group and look at that information all together before you draw some final conclusions and before you move on to the next generation. And then have a system for keeping track of where you are at in your family. So I'll just show you my simple system. So here is, this is a, a sixth great grandfather and grandmother of mine. Um, you'll notice here I have a line where her maiden name should be and that's because I have some conflicting evidence about what her maiden name is and I'm still trying to resolve some of that and look for some more information. But I've identified that this couple um, had four children and now I have just started working my way through their children. And so I'll work, I'll start with the first child and I'll work my way all the way down through their descendants. And then I'll start with the oldest child of that person and then the oldest child of that person. And I'll just work my way one generation at a time. So in the case of this particular family, um, I've worked my way down several generations here through this family and now I am um, you know finally here at this person and this is where I need to pick up my research because we all know this is not a one sitting kind of an event and so I need to be able to keep track of who I was working on last. So in Family Tree Maker one of the um, tools that we have available to us is a bookmark. So I can just right click on this person's name and I've already said it, let me just, there we go. I can add bookmark. And what that does is, over here in my index panel, I have this bookmark feature down here. I can just click on that, and it will bring up the list of people that I have bookmarked in my tree. And there she is, She's um, she's been bookmarked. So I know when I come back to my research, this is the person I need to start with. And because I'm doing these children in order, once I'm finished with Blanche and her family, then I would move on to Imogene and her family. And then once I'm finished with Imogene, because she's the last child in this family, I'd just go back a generation, and Charlotte is the next child after Elizabeth, and I'd move on with her children, and so on. And so that's um, how I keep track of how I do that, is I use the bookmark feature, in Family Tree Maker. You can do something as simple as a post-it note on your computer screen uh, if that works for you, but just have some kind of a system for keeping track of where you're at in the family. And if you do it systematically, oldest to youngest child, then you'll always know when you back up a generation who the next child is to pick up. Now, just like in ancestry research, you want to make sure that you document things as you go. Documentation, um, documenting what you find is probably um, one of the best ways to keep your sanity when doing genealogy research of any kind. Um, you're going to use the same kinds of records that you use in ancestry research. Census records and vital records, vital records being birth, marriage, and death records newspapers, military records, immigration, uh, family and local histories, old published family histories, all of the same kinds of records. The only difference is that you're coming down instead of going back. 
So when you do ancestral research, you're starting with yourself, you're working your way backwards, your parents, your grandparents, and very often when you first get started in family history research doing it that way, you have some of those people still available to talk to. Your parents, your grandparents, maybe some aunts and uncles, some cousins. You have people you can talk to about those living people. Well, when you're doing descendancy research, sometimes you're discovering third and fourth and fifth cousins, and you may not have any contact with them. And one of the, the challenges that we have is we hit what we call the 1940 wall. The 1940 census is the most recently available public census. Here in the United States, census records are private for 72 years before they're released by the government. And so the 1940 census is the last one we have available. So how do you discover more about, if you, if you find a family on the 1940 census, how do you learn if they had more children? How do you learn who those girls in that family married? And so finding living people to whom you have no immediate connection is a little bit trickier. Um, and so here are just some of the resources that I use to do that. The first one and probably the most important one is obituaries. Um, you can search uh, locally or on Google for obituaries. You can search an uh, ancestry.com for obituaries. If you come to the card catalog, um, and you can just type in the word obituary and it will show you that Ancestry.com has a United States obituary collection uh, that, that uh, has 28 and a half million records in that particular collection. And most of those records are fairly new. What we do with this collection is Ancestry actually goes through, let me just mark that exact and pull up an example. Ancestry actually goes through the internet and crawls or um, uh, we do a web crawl for obituaries that are being published by organizations out on the internet. And so we get the information from that obituary and we index it and then uh, we give you a link out to that index if we if it still exists out on the internet. So you can see some of these are very recent and, and Ancestry crawls these on a fairly regular basis. And so, you know, here's one from February of this year. Um, I might be able to find some more recent ones if I really looked. Sometimes you'll see several obituaries for the same person. Here are three for this Alice Shin. Sometimes it's because the newspaper printed it on several days. Sometimes it's because it was printed in several different newspapers. Always check every instance of that obituary. Sometimes it's just a death notice one day and then a full obituary the next day, and then the family noticed some errors and so there were some corrections made on the third day. And so always check all of the different variations. Sometimes if it's a single obituary printed across three or four different newspapers, sometimes different newspapers have different requirements or different allotments for space. And so you may find a, a more complete obituary in one version versus another that may have had to cut some text. And so anytime you see multiple instances, here's another one, one, two, three, four, five um, copies of a single obituary. Always make sure you look at all of them to make sure you've got the most complete information. Now, anytime you do this, it, you're gonna see here this little link that says view full obituary. That's what you're gonna wanna click on to take you out to the internet, to wherever the web page is. In this case, it's the Mountain Democrat, which is apparently California's oldest newspaper, um, where this obituary was published, okay? And so it's gonna take you out to somewhere else online. Ancestry has just crawled or indexed these um, automatically with a computer to pull some of that information. And one of the reasons why obituaries is, are so great, um, the first one is, is, here you see a woman, she's listed by two names, Evelyn Loretta Dunlop and Evelyn Loretta Shin. Well, Shin is her maiden name, and that information was pulled because her parents are listed in her obituary and Dunlop is her married name. So if you didn't know who this woman married, you would still probably be able to find this particular obituary um, searching by her maiden name. So wherever both are in existence or the computer can tell which one's which, we include both so that you can search by both. This obituary will also include information very often about um, 
her family, her children, um, maybe some of her grandchildren. Oftentimes it will list where those people lived as well. And that brings us to this next resource here for finding living people, which is the public records index. If you found an obituary that says that, you know, John Smith, who is the son of, you know, Frank Smith, who just died, lived in, you know, Placer, California, then you can come to this public records index and you can actually look for somebody by that name who uh, is living in that place. That'll help you narrow down some of those search results. Um, it's called the Public Records Index. Public, rec uh, public Record or Records. I can't ever remember its records. Okay, Public Records Index. There is Volume 1 and Volume 2. They both have more than 400 million records in the in the two of them. If you read the database descriptions, you'll find out some of the subtle differences. But here's just an example of how I might search that particular thing, uh, that particular uh, database. I'll put in the name of the person I'm looking for. Now, in this case, I'm going to mark it exact because I'm dealing with current records, so they're more likely to be spelled correctly than old census records or, you know, whatever. And so I'm going to mark all fields exact here, and I'm going to go ahead and click search. I, all I put in was a name. I've got 18 search results, and now, you know, if I know from his mother's obituary that he lived in a particular location, I can then go through and look for that location here. One of the things you're going to notice about the public, re public records index is that it very often will include birth dates of living people. As a matter of fact, you'll probably um, be able to locate yourself in here. These records come from old phone books, old voter registration, and old property records. Um, and so very often your birth date is attached to that and that is considered uh, public information. You might also discover that you're listed two or three times, sometimes with uh, old addresses. This database, I believe, covers 1950 to 1993. And so if you lived in several places over that time period, you may see yourself listed with several different addresses. So this is Public Records Index Volume 1. Now, if I wanted to check Volume 2 without editing my search at all, right, I don't want to change any of the search parameters, I just want to check Volume 2, I'm going to use these little breadcrumb links over here on the left. Just click on one of those and now I've got search results here where I can jump directly to Public Records Index Volume 2 or U.S. City Directories up through 1989 or California City Directories. So I've got lots of resources here available to me to look for the particular person or people I'm interested in. Now, once you find a person that you, you know, this is the person maybe that was listed in the obituary, then make note of that address. This person happens to live on Clareview in San Francisco. 81 Clareview Court in San Francisco. So then I can come in here and I can edit the search. And what I want to do is look for anybody with that last name who is living. I'm going to go ahead and type in San Francisco. Select it from the type ahead. Remember, I've got this marked as exact. And then I'm going to come down here to the keyword field. And I think it was Clareview. I'm going to type in the name of the street and click search. And that will show me if anybody else with that last name lives at that same address. In this case, it doesn't look like they do, but every once in a while you'll end up with a spouse and maybe some, um, some older children in that family as well. So that's a really great way, the public records index, to find living people um, and to be able to connect with them. I'll then take that information a lot of times and I'll go to whitepages.com. The public records index is old addresses and phone numbers, but if you go to whitepages.com, that's current addresses and phone numbers. And so I'll look up that person, see if they're still living at that address. A lot of times they are. Um, sometimes with the information I've collected, I'll go to Facebook. One of the things you can do in Facebook is you can do a search for people named and then the name of whoever it is that you're looking for. And if you happen to know where they live, if they live in San Francisco or if they you know, live in New Jersey or wherever, you can quickly look through that list of people and find them. Now, of course, on Facebook, if you have somebody with a very common name, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So one of the search queries you can do there is people named John Smith who live in California. And then it will show you a, a subset or a, a 
smaller list. And one of the ways you can tell if you've got the right person on Facebook is by looking at their friends list. You know, if you've looked up a person in the family with a little bit more unique name, and then you look at their friends list, you can often see that they have this, the right siblings, or you can see if you know they have friends on their list that have the same maiden name as their mother. Lots of different easy ways to tell whether or not you've got the right person. Now, um, as you're collecting all of this information, make sure you cite your sources and keep good notes. Um, you can attach those records. Let's take you over here to my, my uh, family tree maker. You can attach those records, but also just make sure that you keep track of what you found and what you haven't found. In this case, um, I'm working on this family. I've only found some census records so far. That tells me that I still need to go look for um, a death record for her, possibly a cemetery record if I can locate that, maybe an obituary in a local newspaper there in New Jersey. So lots of different things I need to locate her. Marriage record, Lots of records still missing here, and I can tell that just at a glance because I have made notes about every record I've found as well as just attaching that record. It's just a quick at-a-glance way to tell what I've discovered, what I haven't, what I still need to look for. Okay, so keep good notes, keep track of what you found. Make notes about negative findings as well. So for example, if I've searched the public records index um, for the children listed in an obituary and I you know, couldn't find one of them, I would make a note that I had done that so that I knew that I was looking for um, you know, where I had looked and where I hadn't found information so I don't keep repeating my search. And I know you've all done that where you repeat your search over and over sometimes and you think, this is so familiar, I think I've looked through all of these search results before. Um, but if you keep notes of those negative findings, it'll help you a little bit. Now, one of the unique things about um, descendancy research as compared to ancestry research. When you're doing ancestry research, you know you're always looking for two parents. No matter what, you're always looking for a father and a mother. Uh, and that make, that's a little comforting because you know there's information or hope there's information out there somewhere about two people that you know existed. However, when you're doing descendancy research, you don't know if these people exist or not. You don't know if they had children. You don't know if those children had children or got married even. And so everyone has parents, but not everyone has children or got married. So make sure you note any time you come to the end of a line. And I've just done a really simple thing. I used a, just a basic image creation software like um, actually I use PowerPoint and then created an image out of that and I have these three icons that I use let me just make them a little bit bigger for you here so that you can see what I'm talking about um, this one just says died young never married never had children and the next one says married let's come down to this next one here scroll up a little married no children so I know that this person got married but didn't have any children. And then this one says, never married, no children. Okay, I just will add those, for example, um, as a, the profile picture for a person. And that just really quickly tells me at a glance that, um, that I don't have to keep doing research, you know, that I don't have to keep looking for children or that I don't have to keep looking for a spouse for this person because I have found evidence that suggests that they never married or never had children or that they did marry but never had children. So a uh, really easy way to do that. I've just created these images. I just attach the same image to, I mean, I have the same image attached to hundreds of people in my database, right? I don't re-upload the same image a hundred times. I just grab the same image every time out of my media file and attach it to whichever person it is that I'm working on. So you figure out what system works for you. I also will make a note. For example, I would come in here to my notes if I knew that this person didn't have any children and I would write end of line, uh, never married, no children. And then I would know when I came back and looked at these notes what was happening um, if that was the case. So just make sure you make a note. Otherwise, you'll, again, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to figure out what you missed and, and uh, redoing research that doesn't need to be done. And then the final step in, in some of the descendancy research, and this is just kind of a bonus step, but make yourself findable. Uh, put your tree online at Ancestry.com. I call my online tree cousin fishing, and that's what it is. Like I put it out there, and it's public, and people can find me, and people 
take stuff from my tree and I can see that they've taken stuff from my tree and so I contact them. When other people contact me, I try to respond in a timely manner, um, but I always respond. Sometimes it take, just takes me a little bit of time. But put your tree online, respond when people contact you. Think about starting a blog or starting a Facebook page. Uh, I have several Facebook pages that I have created for specific ancestors. So that third great grandfather, for example, that I talked about at the beginning, um, those 8,700 descendants we've discovered. I've started a Facebook page, not a personal profile. It's not another Facebook profile. It's just a page, like a business page or uh, those pages that you like. Um, I started a Facebook page for that particular ancestor and then just started inviting cousins as I found them online to come join us on that page. It's a place to congregate, to see who's connected, to share information as I discover it. Um, it's also the benefit of a Facebook page is that it shows up really high in search rankings when people are doing Google or Yahoo or Bing searches. And so um, another way to, to make yourself found is uh, to do that. Uh, the other things you can do is, oh, let's come back here, create a form letter uh, that introduces yourself and explains how you think you're related to the person that you're contacting. So I just have a basic form letter. It says, you know, hi, are you the granddaughter of, you know, so-and-so? If so, we're cousins. You don't have to friend me, you know, if I'm sending it on Facebook or, you know, if I'm sending it through Ancestry, uh, here's the link to my tree and come check out what I've learned or discovered already about this common grandfather of ours. And just make a really basic form letter. That way you can just copy and paste it anytime you want to contact anyone. And then the, the key I've discovered to good genealogy karma is to be willing to share and expect nothing in return. Um, now that doesn't mean that you won't get anything in return. I have found that I have received treasures from some of these contacts, but the attitude with which I share sometimes is what determines whether or not people are willing to share information back with me. And so I have to just be willing to share and expect nothing in return. I am just sharing information with these found cousins for the sheer joy of connecting them with their heritage and hopefully sparking more interest in them for this particular branch of our shared family history. And I found a lot of success um, just making that simple attitude adjustment. And it was an adjustment for me, but, uh, but it has worked really, really well. So quick review, because uh, we're running a little long in time here, I think. Focus, you pick one ancestor or one ancestral couple and focus on them. And then um, methodically uh, go generation by generation, collecting all the information you can about a single family, and then working your way down one branch of that family at a time. Document as you go so you can keep track of what you found and what you haven't found and what still needs some more research and so that you know where you're at. And then reach out and contact those cousins. Be willing to um, make some of those connections on Facebook and start a blog, uh, make your tree public, create some uh, ways to contact people to share that information with them. Descendancy research is a lot of fun. I have made some lifelong friends making some of these connections. I've also discovered, like I said, that there are some treasures that have been passed down in some of these families. And some of the people who hold these treasures have had no previous interest in family history until I have contacted them. And so my contact is sometimes the spark that they need to get interested in family history and then to remember, oh yeah, I have that box of pictures in the attic that you know my grandmother gave me 30 years ago or I have the family Bible, it's been tucked away in our you know safe deposit box and we didn't know if anybody wanted it or what to do with it because they'd never thought of it before. Um, and so my contact is sometimes the thing that spurs that one branch of the family to, to get interested in family history or to share the things that they've discovered. Uh, very often we think about our ancestors as our ancestors, and they are. I feel a lot of connection and ownership to my ancestors, but just like that one single third great-grandfather of mine, he has 8,700 descendants, and he belongs to all 8,700 of them too. And you never know what, what little treasure has been passed down in one of those families. Um, and so it's exciting to think about the different traits that different people have, have discovered in our family. I'll just close with this story. Um, in that particular family, as we started 
contacting some of these cousins on Facebook, we noticed a really, really high incidence of red hair. And so I ran a little survey and it turns out that a very, very small population, it's like 7% or 8% or something of the general population has red hair. But in this particular family, more than 35% of the descendants in this family have red hair. And that was just a fun little survey that we ran with all the cousins that we've collected on our Facebook page. Um, lots of other different things you can do to discover what traits have been passed down in your families and to honor some of those ancestors that we feel particularly close to. So I hope that this was useful and that you've uh, enjoyed maybe a little bit of a different perspective on genealogy, in this case, descendancy research. If you have any questions, if you're watching this at our regularly scheduled time, I will be on chat immediately following the presentation and can answer any of the questions that you might have. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, go ahead and just leave a comment. I will monitor those and respond as necessary. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.